Amen. Amen. What a blessing this morning already. If you can't preach after that, you ought to quit, right? Like just, just quit. If you have your Bible this morning, I want to invite you to take it out. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27 as we work our way through this first book of the Bible. When I say the word family feud or words family feud, a couple of things may come to your mind. You may think of the long-running game show that's been hosted by many hosts over the years where two families are pitted together trying to come up with the top five answers or top ten answers. You may think of famous feuds in history and families such as the Hatfields and the McCoys or you might think of the poetry of Romeo and Juliet and the two families that are feuding together, the Montagues and the Capulets, is that right? I, you know, I, I read the cliff notes, so I didn't try to dive too deep into it. Uh, you, you might think of that. When I say family feud, you might think of that last reunion you had when the potato salad ran out and all heck broke loose along the way, right? You might think of that, and there's a lot of things you may think of, but I will guarantee you this. I will guarantee you that the poster children... The example A, the definition of family feud, is probably first seen in Genesis chapter 27 in the family of Isaac and his sons Jacob and Esau and his wife Rebekah. We will read today a far-fetched family feud. There is conniving and scheming, there is pride and trickery, there is defiance of God, there's even the idea of, of stealing one's inheritance. I mean, in Genesis chapter 27, this family, mind you, the family that God has preordained or chosen to carry the lineage of the blessing of Abraham is, uh, in short, a mess. It's a mess. And the reason why I love that this is in the Bible, because every time I look at my family and want to pull my hair out, I'm reminded there's one worse even in the Bible. That, 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 that the Lord uses broken, mischievous, sinful people, families, and still accomplishes his purpose. So we are going to unpack this family feud today and see. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say up front. The first one is, is that we will read the story and there will be parts of the story that will seem like it doesn't make sense. And we have to understand that we're reading a 4,000 plus year old story in an ancient culture in a foreign land. So some of the parts that don't make sense are simply because it would not fit in our modern society understanding the culture. But that does not mean, and this is the second thing that I want to say, it does not mean that it does not apply or is necessary. I must continue to drill this into our hearts and minds. We are reading the book of Genesis, which is a book that is thousands upon thousands of years old. The story we will read today is 4,000 plus years old. But I want you to understand something. Every single sentence, word, letter given to us in the Bible is from God himself to his people. Which means that the story of this family feud that might seem crazy to us and hard to understand is necessary for our walk and faith with the Lord. There are things in this story I wish there were more details. There are parts of this story I wish the Lord had explained to us in a more modern tongue. But listen to me. What's in the Bible is what God has intended for us to have. And brothers and sisters, it is enough. It is enough to know the Lord and his goodness and his love. So when we read this story, and you think to yourself as we walk through it, what in the world does this have to do with me and the stuff I've got to face tomorrow? Well, hear me now. It has to do with you and the stuff you have to face tomorrow because it is given to us from the God who's already in tomorrow and knows we need it. So this morning, we will 
walk through this story. I will serve as the tour guide of the text. I will fill in the gaps and try to give color. And I will try to understand, help you understand what's taking place. And then at the end, after we've painted the picture and understood the story and gotten ourselves all intertwined in the plot of what's happening, at the end, I want to give you three applications for your life. So here's the challenge. You've got to stay with me through the story in order to get the part that matters to you tomorrow. So if you check out early, you're going to be in trouble tomorrow, I can just tell you, all right? All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, would you help us this morning? I know you will, but we ask because you tell us to ask. Lord, would you help us understand your word this morning? As we reach back into this ancient text, this text that was written in antiquity, Father, we understand that there are uh, cultural things, there are uh, parts of the story that seem outlandish, they seem wild, there are parts of the story that just don't make sense to us, and so Lord, we pray you'd help us to uh, lay down our doubt and our uh, suspicions and our skepticism and be reminded today that whether we fully understand it or whether our hearts fully want to conform to it does not matter as fact that it is the truth that you have given us. This is your word. It is the bread of life. We have nowhere else to turn this morning. God, gather us around your word. Let us be a people who understand that that every line and sentence is from you. You have written a book and you have given it to us because you love us. Let us not get lost in the narrative of the story, but yet see the hand of a faithful God who loves his people. God, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to walk you through the text and give you some some phrases in order to just help you hang on with the story. Uh, Kind of like when you you flip on the next episode of your favorite TV show and it recaps what has already happened. My goal is to kind of give you some phrases in order to, to help anchor our mind as we work our way through this entire chapter together. So the first part of the story that you need to see is you need to see Isaac's request. You need to see Isaac's request. This is what Isaac will do. He will begin a request. Now just to remind you, Isaac is the father now. Abraham, his father, has died. Isaac is the patriarch of this family, and he's had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau have been fighting since the womb. The Bible told us just a few chapters earlier in our study of this book that they literally smashed together In their mother's womb. They are fighting in their mother's womb. And then we saw last week where as they grew up, they began to fight over the birthright. Who should get the firstborn birthright? And they trick one another. These two brothers have been at it since before they came into the physical world. They have been fighting and arguing. You think you raised wild kids. These two have been fighting since their mother's womb, right? And so now we come to this climax moment of this battle, and it begins with the father making a request. Look there in verses 1 through 4. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. And he said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat that, so I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. So Isaac has made a request. He's called Esau, his oldest son. He says, Esau, you're a great hunter. We learned this back in the last chapter of our study, that Esau was a man of the field. He loved to hunt. He was a a hairy, burly man, the scripture says, and that he would love to prepare that food. This is a barbecuing, killing machine, right? This is the husband who has the green egg, the black stone, the smoker, the grill, the griddle. Some of you are married to that man. I understand. And so Esau... As a request. Now notice what verse 1 says. It says he was old and his eyes were growing dim. 
Now Moses, the writer, is beginning to help us understand what's going to take place in the story by giving us these words. But here's what we need to know. Isaac is nearing his death. Now it'll be several years before he dies, but his body is failing. His eyesight is failing. In fact, it says not only is he old, but his eyes are growing dim. So literally, what Isaac wants to do is he wants to bring Esau in, and he wants to have a last will and testament ceremony. He wants to have the meal, and then he wants to bless him. In fact, if you look down in verse 4, he says that my soul may bless you. It is a passionate plea of a father saying, I want to feed together, I want to eat together, I want to have a ceremony together, and I want from the bottom of my soul now to put my hands on you, Esau, and I want to bless you. I want to bequeath to you all that I have. You know how many times I've practiced the word bequeath this week just to get that right. I want to bequeath that to you. I want you to have it all. Now, here's the problem. This request of Isaac is 100% against the will of God. It looks normal. It looks fine. On the surface and culturally in this setting, it looks right. The oldest son would get a double portion. They would bring Esau in. They would bless him. They would, he would kneel or something. They would pray over him. They would have, and then the blessing would be passed on, and Isaac would move into deathbed or retirement. He would be honored on his way out, and now Esau would step in and be the, the head of the family, the patriarch of the family. The problem is, well, there are three problems, actually. Problem number one is that this is not what God had prophesied when they were before they were born. In fact, if you were to just scan back over in your uh, Bible, over to chapter 25, verse 23, you will see a birth oracle that was given to Rebekah when she was pregnant with these two boys. And in the birth oracle, the words of God given to her, it says, And the older shall serve the younger. God, before they were ever born, chose that Jacob, not Esau, would be the one to carry the blessing. And yet Esau is willfully trying to go against the word of God by making Esau the one he can bless. In fact, it says in there in the first three verses, Esau, my son, the oldest. He's trying to drive the point home. It's almost like he's convincing himself and God that God got it wrong and he's going to fix it. I don't know about you, but if there's ever a time in your life where you think you need to convince God that God's got it wrong, you might want to hit the brakes right there, all right? So he is going against the word of the Lord. There's a second problem with this. Even if he were going to bless Esau, he would still call all of his children in, but he knows this is wrong. So he is determined to have a single, quiet, secret meeting with Esau. He is trying to be deceptive. See, it looks like a sweet old man that wants to bless his son, but that's not what it is at all. That's the sin of Isaac going against the word of the Lord. That's the sin of Isaac going against the custom of the day to bring all your family in, to bring all your children in. Why would Jacob not be a part of this? Why would Rebecca not be a part of this feast? Why would not every servant get the day off and come to the cookout and be a part of this ceremony? Because Isaac knows he's going against the word of the Lord. And there's a third problem here too. Esau is not worthy of this title. I want you to just look in your Bible real quickly back one chapter to the last few verses. We did not go into the last chapter. We chose to move past it. It's a story of Isaac going down and trying to, <coughs> excuse me, during a famine uh, with King Abimelech. And, and Isaac tries to give his wife away as his sister, much like Abraham. It's a mess, but it's kind of a repetitive story. But I just want you to know this, the last few verses. Look what it says about Esau. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Bera, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. He didn't marry one Hittite, he married two Hittites, and the Bible is very clear to tell us that these two women made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. Why? Because they were not part of God's family. So Esau has already started marrying outside of God's family, right? We talked about this a few weeks ago. This is not a racial issue. This is a faith issue. He's marrying pagans. He's married two of them. The text makes us believe, and in fact, we'll see it at the end of the chapter. He married them just to spite his mom and dad. 
He married them this way. So Esau's life is off the rails. Isaac's disobeying God, and he's trying to be secretive about it. I don't know about you, but this family feud's heating up right off the bat, isn't it? I mean, we're four verses in, and these people are a mess, right? There's hope for your family, is there not? It's a mess here. Now I want to show you a second part of the text, and that's simply this. I want you to see Rebecca's ruse. Not only does Isaac make a request, but Rebecca now gets involved. She's a mess too. Listen to what it says in verse 5. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Now it's a tent. The walls are thin. Rebecca knows Isaac is fading. Rebecca knows Jacob is supposed to be the one. We already know they play favorites. It said that earlier in the chapters. And so now Rebecca is on high alert, always looking out for Jacob, always looking out for what's happening. So she's heard, she's heard Isaac, who probably, who in his old age is losing some of his hearing. He probably didn't whisper very well. She's heard what happened. Notice what it says in verse 5. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son, now Esau's her son too, but we already see what Moses, the writer, is trying to remind us of, that they have been pitting one another against each other this whole time. She wants to pick her son. Jacob, uh, Isaac wants to pick his son. See, my parents didn't have this problem. They liked me both over my brother, so it didn't matter. <laughs> now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, she's speaking now to Jacob, obey my voice as I command you. Now, this is one of the only times in the Old Testament where a woman is commanding a man. She is being very authoritative here. She wants him to do what she says. She's pulling out the mama card right here. Verse 9. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare for them, prepare for them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and he shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food with his father's, that his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her youngest son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. Does this not sound like a Lifetime movie? I mean, this is a mess. Now notice what she does. She says, wait a minute, my son. Esau's about to get what you're supposed to get. Let me tell you what we're going to do. And she thinks of almost everything. She said, we got to get the food that will warm Isaac's belly. Go get me two young lambs. Get me the tender lambs from the flock, the ones without blemish. We'll prepare them just right. She will cook the food, and Jacob will carry out the ruse. Then what does she say? She says, now your brother's hairy, and so what we're going to do is take a little bit of this rough lamb skin, and we're going to put it on your neck, and we're going to put it on your arms and hand, so when the blind old man reaches up to hug you, or touch you, or bless you, he will feel that, and he will know. Not only that, notice what it says about the clothing. She went into uh, uh, Esau's closet and found one of his clothes. Now, we understand that the Bible has already told us that Esau was a man of the field, right? Which means Esau was always out hunting, and this is the Middle East. He's a hairy man. You're talking about some odor right here, right? I mean, this is, this is like seventh grade locker room type stuff, right? And so what happens? She puts the clothing on him, so he has a scent. Now, we all understand this. We understand scent. We understand this. Your, 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 um, your, your uh, 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 wife is gone for a few days and roll over and miss that smell, right? I mean, in the kitchen. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so... So she's not in this service. Uh, so, so, uh, so you guys get some stuff I don't say in the next one because she's, she's never mind. Um, 
<laughs> but you understand, you understand a smell, you know, a person. So she thinks of everything in this ruse. I want his skin to be hairy. I want him to smell. We're going to make this a good meal. She is a scheming, conniving, manipulative. She is literally trying to, hear the pun, pull the wool over Isaac's eyes. That's what she's trying to do. And she brings her son in on it. Let's do this together. Now, you might say, well, Jacob has to obey his mother. No, 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 no. Let me show you a third part of this story. I want you to see Jacob's ruthlessness. Jacob will not stop till he gets this blessing. In fact, if you look there in verse 12, he objects. He says, wait a minute. My brother's hairy. I'm smooth. What if, what if I get caught and it feels like I'm mocking an old blind man? That will not go well. I'll get a curse driven on me. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say this is morally wrong, mom. This is ethically wrong, mom. That's not what he says. He says, what if I get caught? He, he, he's not moral in this. He's not ethical in this. This whole family is full of sin and brokenness. And so what does he do? He says, Mom, what happens if I get caught? And she tries to persuade him by saying, well, I'll take whatever curse. I'll take the blame. Now, we have no idea if the curse can be transferred because we understand later that the promise can't be transferred. But she wants to reassure him. So she says, I'll, I'll take the curse. Let it be me. And so now his objection of being caught is subdued. So he follows the plan. And so what does he do? Here's what he does. Look, look at the next part of the text. Look at verse 18. So he went to his father and he said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Notice the lie and the emphasis. I'm your firstborn. I have done as you've told me. Now sit up and eat my game that your soul may be blessed. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Now this is important. He's, got to give, he's fixing to give the family blessing, and so he has to make sure to verify this is the right thing. This is not that he's necessarily super suspicious. It's just part of come close, let me touch your face, let me, let me feel you, right? Notice what happens. He said, uh, verse 21, then, uh, then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you my son to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his, and he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he uh, brought him wine and he drank. Now I just want you to notice how ruthless Jacob is. He says, Father, I'm here. Now if you'll notice with me just for a few minutes, it says in the text that he, at the beginning of the text he's talking a lot. Here I am, I'm your firstborn son. I'm right here, I brought you food. He's using a lot of words. Unfortunately, they thought of everything but one problem, the voice. A mom knows their kid's voice. One day I was helping a man run some fence for a cattle farm. They had just had calves all over the place. And all these calves were mooing. Right? That's, I learned that in Hebrew. Um, <laughs> they were mooing. And the most fascinating thing was with all the mooing, right, all the mooing all over the place, over beside me was this big old mama cow. And she went, Mrrr. and all the way across the pasture, over all the mooing, there was this little calf and went, Mrrr, and started running to his mama. Mama, y'all like that, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> you don't, you look, hey, listen, seminary teaches you all kind of stuff, man. <laughs> but I was fascinated in the fact that what happened? That mama knew its kid's voice. Parents know. So they've thought of everything but one problem. The voice. But notice with me what happens. Just, just see what Jacob does. Look at how slick he is. Up until this point, he's talking a lot. I'm Esau, your firstborn. He even brings the Lord's name into this. God gave me blessing. I swear God did this. Whoo, we're treading on some bad water here. He invokes the Lord's name. 
He's got the skins on. He's lying to Isaac in every way you can. But notice with me what happened. He said, uh, look down at verse 22. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Now I want you to notice something. At that statement, Jacob does not say anything else except I am. He's so ruthless that he understands, i got to quit talking because I'm going to give it away. So the only dialogue left for Jacob all the way down through the rest of the story is Jacob saying, I am. He probably tried to sound like Esau, I am. (laughs) Why? Because he knows i got to push this all the way to the end. He is lying. He's invoked the name of the Lord in this lie. He is going every direction you can in telling this story against the truth. Now notice what happens, though. He gets the blessing. Look at verse 26. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as of the smell of the field that the Lord is blessed. Here's the blessing, verse 28. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. That blessing, the dew of heaven, means may the Lord bless your agriculture. May the rains of heaven fall, may the dew of the ground, may the desert open up to you. And then he says, may you have lots of grain and wine, which means may your vineyards grow, may your gardens grow. It's literally an agricultural financial blessing. He's saying may everything you touch, everything you touch, your green thumb just explode. And then notice the second part of the blessing, verse 29. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. Now remember, Isaac thought he was giving this blessing to Esau. If Isaac had given this blessing to Esau, he would have been in direct rebellion against the oracle of God. God said before they were born, the older shall serve the younger. But here, he thinks he's blessing Esau by saying, may all your brothers bow down to you. Isaac thinks he's rebelling against the way of God and fixing what God has done wrong, and yet he's blessing Jacob and fulfilling the birth oracle. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Let me show you a fourth truth from the text, and that's Esau's ruin. We've got to move quickly here. Look at verse 30. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob was scarcely gone out of the presence of Isaac, his father uh, Esau, his brother, came in. You can feel the drama building, right? One slips out the back door while one comes in the front door. Moses is reminding us how big a deal this is in this family. The tension is growing. The movie plot is accelerating. Notice what he says in verse 31. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat his son's game that he may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it that hunted game and brought it to me and I ate it before you came? And I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, even me, alas, oh my father. But he said, your brother has come deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? He's using a play on words here for thief. Is he not Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you and all his brothers. I have given to him for servants with grain and wine. I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Now listen to this, because this is not a blessing. This is a curse. Look at verse 39. And Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. You'll be a nomad. You'll live in tents. Away from the dew of heaven will be on you. You you won't get the farming and agriculture and blessing of your brother. Verse 40, By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. This is a prophecy of the Edomites. The Edomites will be under the control of Israel for many, many centuries until later when the kingdoms break down and then finally the Edomites raise up against the house of Jacob. But it will be a long time from now. 
And so if you'll notice with me, you might say, boy, Esau really got the raw end of the deal. But I want you to notice something in this text. All Esau cares about is the blessing. All he cares about is the financial gain. All he cares about is owning all the stuff. And he says, Father, can't you just give me something? But see, here's the problem. Isaac was so quick to bless Esau that he did not want to bless Jacob. So when he thought he was blessing Jacob, he gave the fake Esau all the stuff because he didn't want the real Jacob to be over his brother. And by doing that, he's now made the real older brother have nothing. So if you've given everything to one son, you got nothing to give the other son. You have no blessing to pass down. Now here's culturally where we need to just stop for a moment and remind ourselves. This to me on first reading makes no sense. Because I would immediately call a family meeting. I'd beat both of my boys just because they deserved it. And then I would tell Jacob, you lying scoundrel, give your brother back his stuff, right? But we have to understand, this is a God-ordained, God-invoked blessing, which means it is a irreversible. How do I know this? Because the Bible says there what happened to Isaac when he found out? He shook terribly. He cannot go back on his word. He cannot go back on the blessing that he's called down from heaven. He cannot go back on what he has done, and he is bitter. Now, you know Esau went around all over town telling everybody, today's the day I'm getting my blessing. Today's the day the old man's giving me all the stuff. I'm going to bring my two Hittite wives, and we're going to take over, and we're going to do what we want to do, and today is the day. And so what happens when he doesn't get it? He weeps bitterly. Esau is now... Ruin. Now we must get to the end of the story, and here is where I want you to understand how it matters to you. I want you to see one final truth, and then I'm going to give you three quick applications. I want you to see God's rescue. You see, I've told the story to you. I've tried to walk you through it. You've probably read it, some of you many times in here. Uh, but I've tried to give you the color of it and all the details of it. But now I want to tell you why it matters in the kingdom of of God. Look at the text with me again. Pick up with me in verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to him, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. <clears throat> then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So he's so mad he's going around telling people, when daddy dies, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get my brother. I'm going to fix this. I'll take matters into my own hands verse 43 verse 42 but the words of Esau her older son were told to Rebekah so she went and called Jacob her younger son and said to him behold your brother Esau comforts himself by planning to kill you now therefore my son obey my voice arise and flee to Laban Laban is Rebekah's brother back in the home country brother in Haran and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? If he kills you, then I'm going to lose Esau and Jacob. I'm going to lose both my sons in one day if this doesn't stop. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life. Now she's figuring out a way to send Jacob away. She's got to get Isaac's blessing. So notice what she does. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women in the land, what good will my life be? Your, your oldest son married two terrible women. Let's don't let the youngest one make that mistake. So notice what happens, verse 28. We'll look at the last bit here. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise and go to Peta Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Go marry in the family. Now here's the blessing. Look at verse 3. Isaac's now come to the conclusion that Jacob is the one to carry the blessing. So notice what he says. God Almighty bless you, make you faithful, multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offsprings with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojourning that God gave to Abraham. There it is. The fulfillment of the birth oracle, the fulfillment of God's plan in the midst of all of this broken family, there it is. Now, we have to ask ourselves, Pastor, this is a great story. I mean, it kept us on the edge of our seat. You told us about it. 
You made us laugh along the way. I've never heard a pastor moo in the middle of a sermon. But pastor, i got to go to work tomorrow. What in the world does this have to do with me? I want to give you three applications from this story that I think will help you in your walk with the Lord. Application number one, our sins have consequences. Our sins have consequences. I want you to understand that the way in which this family acted affected their lives. They came to give an account to the Lord. How do I know this? Because you know how Rebecca said, hey, Jacob, go over to my brothers, find a wife. I'll call you when your brothers calm down. 20 years later, 20 years later, Jacob will get to come back, and he's still got to face his brother who is mad. 20 years later, and there is no record in Scripture that he ever saw his mom again. She broke her family. Her scheming broke her family. Isaac will go to his deathbed with one son living in a foreign country, one son living in sin and rebellion, and a wife who has schemed against him. He's lost all control of his family. Esau, if you look there in your Bibles just for a moment, after the verses I read, you'll notice what happens. It says there in chapter 28 about God or Isaac blessing Jacob. But if you read down to verse 6, your Bible in English may even have a heading. It says Esau marries an Ishmaelite. It literally says in the text in verse 6, Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, sent him away to take a wife from there. And he blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife. And so verse 7, And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone. So verse 8, listen to this now. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took one. He's going further into sin. I'm so mad at my mom and dad, I'm going to marry another pagan woman. I'm going to bring another sinner into this story. I'm going to rebel again. Sin has broken this family. Listen to me now. Part of the problem in your family is your sin. Part of the problem in your family is not falling on your knees and confessing your sin, telling your family members where you have failed, where you are broken, asking for forgiveness and turning from your sin. Because your sin will have and has consequences. Application number two. Our families have a calling. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us what a Christian family should look like. There's a lot of words in there, but I've pulled out just parts of it because I want you to see it. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, not because he deserves it, but because the Lord is worshipped when you live this way. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Serve your wife all the way to death. Make her the center of your life in the serving of your hands, next only to Christ. And then, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband. Children, this is Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is the calling of a Christian home. Wives, act like Christian wives. Husbands, act like Christian husbands. Children, obey and act like Christian families. Some of you, your families are in a mess because you're not obeying the Lord. You're obeying selfishness and pride and living after your own desires and your own ways. And you're working against the way of the Lord. And the schemes of man will bring sin and sin will bring consequences. Some of you husbands toiling in a marriage that is falling apart and it's simply because you're not acting like you're supposed to. Some of you wives are toiling in a marriage that's falling apart and it's simply because you're not acting like the word says. Some of your parents are, your families are going crazy because you're not raising your children the way the word says. Some of you just need to confess your sin and say we have a higher calling as a family. If I learn anything from Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau is don't live like this. D- don't do it this way. Let me give you a third and final application, and this one just makes me smile from side to side. God has a plan. I love the fact that the Bible does not sugarcoat the people that are so broken in it. Because when I read this story, it's very easy for me to say, well, I'm not like that. I'm not like Rebecca or Isaac or Esau. I'm not like Esau. I never get mad when I don't get my way. 
I never just look out for what I want. I'm not like Jacob. I never lie and scheme. I'm not like Isaac. I never go against God's word. I'm not like any of those. And then obviously you hear the humor in my voice. I'm like every one of them and sometimes all at once. And yet what does God do? He still blesses this family. He still blesses Jacob. And we know the story of the blessing of this family. Abraham carried it. Isaac carried it. Jacob will carry it. Then the sons of Jacob will carry it. And they will carry that blessing all the way until the Savior Jesus Christ will come on the scene to save us all. As one preacher would say, the Lord hits straight licks with crooked sticks. Some of y'all have to think on that for a few minutes. It'll get to you. He takes his broken family and he saves people. He has a plan to save people. Jesus said himself, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not that which was good, not that which was religious, not that was doing everything right. The lost, the terrible, the broken, the mistaken, the fallen, the quarry. All of the sin that I carry, all the brokenness, all the problems I've caused. And yet God still has a plan to save his people. In spite of this family, God still had a plan to rescue his people. I am so thankful that my sins have consequences, and I will confess them, and I will have to deal with them, and I'll be responsible for them, and God disciplines those he loves, and my family will have ups and downs, but I'm so faithful that at the end of the day, no matter how big a mess I may make, that mess will never, ever get in the way of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that God used this broken family feud to show me his mercy. Let me close with a passage of scripture from Paul. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 13, he talks about the Lord. And and just listen to what he says. He says, this saying is trustworthy. If you have died with him, meaning Christ, you will also live with him. That means if you trusted, put your faith in him, you've been saved, you've been uh, uh, resurrected through baptism. You know, we, we talk about buried with Christ, raised with him. If you've given your life to Christ, you've died with him, then you'll be saved with him. Notice what it says, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we walk in the faith with the Lord until the end of our life, then the Lord will bring us into his kingdom and we will reign with him forever. Now notice what else it says. If you deny him, he will deny us. Now, you, you have to confess Christ. You've got to come to Christ. That's the, that's the line. But this last sentence is actually the one that's just so crazy to me. It says, if we are faithless. Now, if I were writing this, I would say, then he is faithless. That's not what it says. It says, if we are faithless, he remains. What's it say? Faithful. Lord is faithful even when I am not. Oh, what a good God. What a powerful, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Whatever you've done, wherever you are, whatever your family may be dealing with, whatever mess you have made, you can confess your sin, you can turn to Christ, and you can be reminded you've been faithless, but he's still faithful. Let's pray together, Father. Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us online. It is so great that through technology you were able to join us today. I hope while you got to sing with God's people and hear his word preached, you were moved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Maybe while you were worshiping with us online, the Lord began to prompt your heart. Maybe he's calling you to make some sort of decision or follow him in a more tangible way. Or maybe you just realized you need some help and you want some other people to come along beside you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If that's the case, we want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to tell you that we're a church that's here for you. There are two ways that you can contact us. First, you can click on the link in this post above the video and you'll find all kinds of ways to hear more about who we are, fill out a contact information, or put in a prayer request. Or if you'd like to, you can email the email that's coming across the screen now, prayer at brushycreek.org. If you send an email to that address, it will get to our staff, and we'll be glad to return it, to pray for you, and to care about you. It is so neat to be able to worship together from all over the world. We would love for you to come join us in person sometime, but until then, we hope to meet you here again next week.